Hello, everybody. We are here with uh, an audience, a live audience. Live audience, would you register your presence by putting your hands together or something? Yeah. That's it. This is Ian Morrison, who is becoming, by the hour, a friend, a dear friend, and a wonderful poet who has written a poem called, or who has put together a poem called Rude Emily Dickinson. Rude? How rude. Um, and we have a panel of people, Irene Toro Modano, I always pronounce it differently, and I apologize profusely for that. Um, Lainey Brown, hello, Lainey. And, and Lee Ann Brown, right? OK, and Anthony Capaldeo, and Ian Morrison aforementioned. And what we're going to do to start is, is ask the panel to just speculate on um, how you think Ian composed. What is the compositional process for this poem? We might be wrong. We might be right. We might be adding to Ian's knowledge of how he himself. Do you want me to read it first? Or? I would love for yeah. you to read it first. And then we'll start with Laney on deducing the compositional process. Rude Emily Dickinson. Love, thou art high. Experience from that naked bar. The fragrant cocks restore my booty. The booty and the sorrow its sweetness to have known. But this time, adequate, her hand whiter than the sperm, born on a dusky breast, drew the head erect in a bed of hair to touch. Bliss were an oddity without thee. Wow. Laney. Yeah, really. <laughs> Laney, now be a little, uh, naive is the wrong word, but be a little introductory, like for Don't people. Don't say it flat out. OK. No, do say it flat say it out. Flat like, out. What, what do you think, the con what's going on Well, here? this is a collaboration between Ian and Emily, clearly. Okay. In and some what kind form of or another. Friendly, support, mutually supportive? Absolutely. OK. W so what's rude? What's rude <laughs> is that it's very raunchy, erotic. OK. Leanne Brown, pick it up from there. What's the compositional process? Oh, I just I see Ian uh, reading in the middle of the night and just writing down on the margins, like the, the dirty part, the dirty bits. Yeah. What, what, what time of day? <laughs> At night. Uh, yeah. There's an assumption. Okay, so so Ian wild is, night. Wild Ian night. is no. yes. Ian is having a wild night or a not wild night. Well, I'm not going to go there. Um, <laughs> Ian is having Ian's Ian's according to Leanne Brown. Ian is in bed at night reading Dickinson and using a yellow highlighter to find sexy stuff. <laughs> or scribbling in the margins. I see. Yeah. Scribbling in the margins. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, Irene, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I like the, the yellow highlight because it's. To me, there's something about composing, but there's also something about revealing something that's already there. Mm -hmm. um, I guess later we might speculate as to whether it's a pink or purple highlighter. Um, <laughs> because, I, well, I think, that, I think there's some queering of the sexuality, maybe. I don't oh, know. Yeah, yeah. Mm, because Eros is a strong purple god. Anthony, what are your thoughts about the compositional process? My thought is that uh, Emily Dickinson uh, is uh, lounging on a bar in a kind of uh, jazz bar and you know she has got up onto the counter and Ian is saying love thou art high to try to get her to come down safely. <laughs> 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 and the rest oh of the rest of the rest of the poem is you trying to woo her down. Marvelous. Um, Ian I'm just gonna say something and then it's all yours to tell us what you actually did, if that means anything, or if that's significant after these fabulous ideas. Um, I, I, when I read the poem, and then I realized what was going on, that you were taking lines from a variety of Dickinson poems, and we could look at that if you want. My first reaction was, wow, how cool. This is Ian's Emily. So, and I want to know, Ian, one wants to know the poet. One wants to know the speaker. And this is Ian's Emily. What better a way to know Ian than to triangulate with Emily? Because I'm very familiar with Emily. And then the second and third time through, I started to have doubts. Like, did she say fragment, fragrant cocks? Really? Did you just make that up? Did she say whiter than the sperm? Did she really? Did she say true, drew the head erect? And on drew the head erect, 
because Laney, who provided all the, the cheat sheet of highlighting the lines that were taken, for one reason or another, didn't find or didn't highlight, drew the head erect. And I thought, oh, maybe Ian cheated once and drew that in there. But in fact, it's there. So you made me do a kind of um, excited censoriousness of my own unwillingness to see Emily to be this libidinal. Cool. That's, that, that's great. I'm really glad that you had fun questioning yourself and searching for the lines. But that's kind of how it happened to me. So the context for when I wrote this, I was doing this durational performance that I've done a few times where I read all of Emily Dickinson's poems. Although I think this was before the publication of the Envelope poems, so there's more now, so I'll have to do it again. Um, over a number of days, and I was kind of playing with that in, you know, it's a bit, a bit like um, what we talked about earlier, the, the internal, external, element of her. And I was dressed in a long white dress uh, in various confined spaces. Was um, it a Dickinsonian dress? Yeah, it was the cl I, got, I got a costume maker to make the closest thing so they could find to, to her. Modest top. Yeah. yeah. And maybe half sleeves. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it was a slightly kind of cheated version of that using a, a sort of Edwardian night dress, but it was to try and get close to, cl close to that. But this was in Berlin, and um, I was in the subway. Um, you performed it in Subway, 1,700 plus poems? Yeah, yeah. And um, like it was in this bit that I think they normally use for keeping garbage. It was behind bars. It was like a kind of jail. Anyway, it was, it was, so what did the Parisians say? The Berlinians. The, oh, sorry, did yeah, I Bar say Paris? Yeah, you did. Somehow <laughs> I assumed it was Berlinians, Paris. Berlinians, yeah. yeah uh, a mixture of things. Like some people really stayed with it. Um, some people were kind of shouting out things about Heroin. Uh, the train guard tried to heroin, throw me out. not Emily Dickinson. No, heroin. no. Well, well, maybe I miss her actually. William Burroughs heroin. She's my heroine. I, oh. I wish. It, I wish it was that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, and I was having to kind of wave my papers at train staff who'd come round, like thinking that I'd just broken in because uh, it was part of this literature festival. Anyway, while I was doing it, my attention wavered into different states, as, as it would do, you know, when you're reading the work. And I was trying to map the poems. Um, with a sort of cartography of like, this one feels like it sits more with her bedroom, this one sits more with the graveyard, the, you know, just to try and, because I, I love the, the, the performance is called Subject Index, because I love the subject index at the back of the Jonathan edition of her poems, which ostensibly helps you to find the poem if really you can remember. really silly. Yeah, right, so silly. Because so you're doing your own version yeah. of a subject index. Yeah, I'm making a subject index. But as it was going on, and I, and I became a bit, snow blinds um, to the poem. Sometimes what was just punching through was the innuendo. <laughs> so I started jotting down the innuendo um, and at the end I realised that I had you know, these lines that I could make a, a rude Emily Dickinson version out of. But it's probably significant that I was in Berlin for a week hanging out with all these great uh, other performance artists and, and literature People, um, you know, as a queer person in a very queer city, um, you know, they're thinking about what it was for me to be embodied in that space. And in some ways, I think the Emily Dickinson was reading me as much as I was reading her. I have one more little follow-up question for you, and then I'm going to ask a few of our panelists to go searching into the Dickinson poems to find the line and try to help us create some maybe just fun context for the decision to choose that line. So here's my follow-up question. Um, can you describe the pleasure, excitement, or otherwise, of finding, for this relatively short poem of yours, finding the line that would work perfectly? I mean, it is somewhat like a party game that we could probably, you know, a collaborative poem game that we could do at a pub where we say, let's make a, you know, let's make a poem uh, out of lines from so and so, yeah. um, and then make them work because it actually does work as a love poem of sorts. So, what was the feeling as a composer poet when you found the stuff that worked? Kind of like she really said that, <laughs> like, like um, surprise. Yeah, surprise. But also, maybe, maybe it's worth just saying something about her uh, lexicon. Uh, because, of course, many of these words that seem filthy to a reader here and now in this space are doing this kind of uh, different job for her. Like, Cox, it's, it's not even the bird, it's Haycox. So she's talking about, like, these Haycox in, in, the, you know, in the yard and one of those, like, oh, I'm dying and I can smell the Haycox as I'm being taken to the grave type moments. Um, and one of the things that I recommend 
as a way of reading her work is, I don't know if people know about it, there's a great site online called the Emily Dickinson Lexicon that has her dictionary that she used. And often the meanings are wild, right? The, the, the definitions really surprise me. So like for, for booty, I was like, booty, something you steal. One of the main definitions for it is departed loved ones. And I'm like, okay. Really? Right, yeah, they go really metaphorical for, for How did she mean it, do you think? I'd have to look back at the source for that one to, to, to see. But the theft I, of treasure, maybe? Yeah, but, but, but I think often she is talking about the death of, uh, you know, there's so many poems about, oh, you're beyond me now, and since heaven, you know, it's often not said heaven, but since you were taken away and, and they won a rich prize, all, all of that. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't surprise me if it was something about, you know, someone who's not physically present. Anymore. I'm hearing the um, voice, a bubble above someone's head, uh, of a person who's not in this room and is not the least bit antagonistic or critical of you. But I'm hearing someone out there say, well, I really like Emily Dickinson and it's complicated enough and you are misreading or deliberately decontextualizing what cock might have meant. How dare you? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, oh, your response is hot. Good. Okay, that's, that, is the, that is the best response. Okay, I'm going to ask a couple of our panelists to pick out a line from a Dickinson poem and help us create some context. So I wonder if, Lainey, you're prepared to do one? And it might require you reading the Dickinson poem if it's short. Sure. Well, I want to respond to Ian's just glossing the fragrant cox as the hay cox and thinking about death what, and what poem is sex. It? So it's uh, 529. So poem 529, for uh -huh. those people watching this video later, following In the home, Johnson. This is the Johnson numbering 529. Um, would you read the whole poem? It's a little long, but. Sure. I'm sorry for the dead today. It's such congenial times. Old neighbors have it fences. It's time, O oh year, for hay. And broad sunburned acquaintance discourse between the toil and laugh a homely species that makes the fences smile. It seems so straight to lie away from all the noise of fields, the busy carts, the fragrant cocks, the mower's meter steals. There's more. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Turn the page. A trouble lest they're homesick, those farmers and their wives sit separate from the farming and all the neighbors' lives. A wonder if the sepulchre don't feel a lonesome way when men and boys and carts and June go down the fields to hay. So what was done by our poet, Ian Morrison, if done is the wrong word, probably, but what, what, what happened? So the, uh, uh, transfiguring death as sex, or That's you know, happened. coupling death and sex, which is actually a, it's a classic Emily Dickinson move in it. Drawn from the Renaissance in her own her. kind of way. So it just seems like a brilliant, a brilliant turn and movement across time because we, we know when mm -hmm. we think of death and elegy, we're probably not thinking about hay carts. At least I'm not. Beautiful. Usually, I'm going to turn to Leanne, but before that, Leanne, I'm just going to insert an obvious observation, which is that this is ever so much interpretation of Dickinson. So a poet who's using a quasi aleatory compositional process, who's writing phrases that are not original to the poet, is creating a kind of criticism, as in literary criticism. And you accept that. That's what you are, I mean, that sounds right to yeah, you. Yeah. yeah. And I just want to say the obvious, which is that all of us here are th giving three cheers to that function of the poet as a possibility. Um, Leanne, you got one for us? Yeah, I'm not sure if it's the whole one, but the J1722 at the bottom of the page. 1722, and it's a long poem, and I don't, can we do a gist of it? Well, you can, we can read it. I just, oh, no, no, that, that one's only small. It's, um, oh, sorry, not. Yeah, yeah, it's just one stanza, that 17, one. 17, I don't even have it, I don't think. Okay. Yeah, that's worth reading, actually. Okay, 1722, you actually got there. That's late. Yeah, yeah, I got there. Right. It's just yeah. about as late a poem if Johnson's chronology is right. Well, at that point, it's the, there the, ever was. They're the ones he, the, he doesn't know the dates. He so who knows? Dates. Yeah, they were in the drawer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Leanne, you want to read it? Okay. 
But that's the same poem as this, as we went out and in? Uh, 1722, her face was in a bed of yeah. hair. Where does it continue? It ends in who witnesses believes. That's it. It's short, actually. It's only that. OK, got it. Her face was in a bed of hair, like flowers in a plot. Her hand was whiter than the sperm that feeds the sacred light. Her tongue more tender than the tune that totters in the leaves. Who hears may be incredulous, who witnesses believes. It's an amazing poem. It's an amazing poem. Yeah. Um, Leanne, we, two of us just said it's an amazing poem. Is it amazing? Yeah, and so, I've never us, even seen it before. Yeah, <laughs> it's, like, it's new. I mean, I just, that image of her face in a bed of hair is just the most sexual thing I could imagine. I mean, it's like, I had, you know, I see kind of lingus, I see, um, Helen Adams, I love my love, where the hair comes out of the grave and engulfs the man and goes back and then goes back again. And just this amazing, um, and when, you, when the hair grows after the body is dead and the grave, and it's just very sensual, sexual, um, tousled. So in yeah. this case, yeah. Ian, yeah. I yeah. think, thank you, Leanna. Yeah. In this case, I think you have not challenged the context, but drawn it out. Yeah. Born on a dusky breast, drew the head erect in a bed of hair. It works. Yeah, I think so. I mean. This poem, I saw someone on social media um, talking about it and saying, I'm sorry, guys, this is an Emily Dickinson poem about fucking. <laughs> like, you know, the end. Um, and, and, and yeah, what do you I mean think, when you say, I'm sorry, guys? Because I think, I think someone like, was dealing with that presumption that she wouldn't write a poem about fucking. You know, like, there's, there's a degree which I think is now being addressed in Emily Dickinson reading of her, of what's been hiding in plain sight the whole time. So none of what Leanne said seems like it can't be part of the poem as Emily Dickinson experienced the process of writing it, mm -hmm. I guess. So drawing out what's there, um, sexing up what's there, yeah. I mean, and, I, I not, come and not, yeah. and, just, and just harmonizing with it. Those, yeah. are, those are many options, right? Yeah, and I think there are readings of it that could like, not be sexual, for sure. You know, like the idea of the, the hair just being what surrounds us you know, like a beautiful face surrounded by a mane of hair or something. And of course you can be like, oh, but the sperm is like the spermaceti oil that feeds the light in the tap. You know, you, you, you can skirt around it, um, but I think it's there. Wonderful. Anthony, do you have one you want to draw us to? Yes, I'm looking at uh, J900 and uh, that's uh, Johnson 900 uh, for the people who I can't see and some of the people I can see. and. Uh, that is the Would I Restore My Booty. Mm. Could you read the poem, the Dickinson? What did they do since I saw them? Were they industrious? So many questions to put to them. Have I the eagerness? That could I snatch their faces? That could their lips reply? Not till the last was answered should they start for the sky. Not if their party were waiting. Not if to talk with me were to them now homesickness after eternity. Not if the just suspect me and offer a reward. Would I restore my booty to that bold person, God? What's going on with the booty line? Well, Trying to get away from the idea of shaking your booty and the jazz bar. I'm thinking about booty in terms of treasure because reward and booty there and a kind of religious context to lay not up your treasure on earth. Also the idea of people who are lost by death. So like with the medieval pearl poem that you lose the person who's your pearl of great price and can only speak to them over the river. But what I'm really getting here is the difference between a love that is eternal, perfect, and infinite, uh, which would be the love of God in a properly understood religious concept, context, uh, as distinct from a love which is adequate. So you've got, but this time, adequate uh, in your poem, Ian. So it's a mortal moment uh, of, OK, this will do. <laughs> but then you've got to touch bliss uh, with oddity without thee. And so what I'm getting here is a feeling of distance and yearning. And so in both of them, uh, there's a feeling of distance and yearning uh, of uh, 
you know, the, the, that which one loves or the source of love is somehow far away. But in one case, you're going very far into the kind of hairy imperfection yeah. of human love, mm -hmm. uh, whereas Dickinson is doing a kind of Don Giovanni wager that I'm going to you know, hold on to my loves in this world, uh, even though the love of the next world uh, is something so wonderful that I wouldn't miss the loves of the world if I really knew it. Lovely. Marvelous. Thank you. Um, I'm, uh, thank you so much. I, I want to turn to Irene for the last one, uh, last one of these. But Ian, I just want to pause and ask you, this is going to sound like a dumb question, but it's meant sincerely. Um, how does it feel to be having this work taken so seriously by such perceptive readers of Dickinson and thus of you? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a delight. And um, what I am enjoying is that there's an ascent in the room. It feels like everyone is enjoying like the deconstruction of a myth around um, not just Emily Dickinson, but around any person who uh, enjoys words and enjoys sex, you know, and the contraction of those things into shared experience. And you referred to the room, you meant this one. I mean this room, yeah, yeah, yeah but any room. Because I'm always into the metapedagogical. Say more about the room, what does that mean? A community of readers of Dickinson who are um, I, I guess it's like for, for me there's affirming what you're doing as a poet yeah rather than treating you as maybe some Berliners did as you were performing it like oh who is that person there is no who is that person here no well, there, well there's not because you, you you've successfully introduced me four times as well <laughs> So I can't there. tell it. Is that a literal response to my question? We know your name is Ian Morrison. Um, no, but 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 I, but I, yeah, I, I I guess what what I hope for my work in general and for this poem is that it broadens the space of who's permitted into sexuality and the enjoyment of sexuality, including Emily Dickinson herself. Um, yes. Beautifully said. Okay, Irene's going to take us to one more of these, a bit of extractions, and then we'll get final words from our panelists and let Ian just listen to the final words of others. Okay, Irene? Uh, 1464. 1464. And I suppose, Eleni, when we put this video up, we will create a PDF that's accessible by the site for people to read the Dickinson. Okay. All right. Irene, do you want to read that one? One thing of it we borrow and promise to return. The beauty and the sorrow, its sweetness to have none. One thing of it we covet, the power to forget. The anguish of the avarice defrays the dread of it. Um, and I really like that it starts with one thing of it we borrow. And I feel like Ian is like borrowing all the time little things of it. <laughs> um, it talks about the power to forget and somehow you are also not letting us um, forget everything that is in the poems. Uh, and well, we were talking about how sometimes uh, all of this is already in Emily Dickinson, but we may not want to read it or may not want to see it. And, and I find beautiful that you're kind of not letting us forget that all of it is here. And I mean, if we go to the, to the letters to Susan, for example, it's there even more openly and explicitly, but in the poems, we can still have this choice of not seeing it, but you are making us <laughs> face it and see it. So. Making sure we don't think of them as chaste. Um, and also you've achieved a significant thing that maybe critics have never noticed, which is that she uses booty twice <laughs> <laughs> for emphasis. Okay, final <laughs> thoughts from our panelists. And Ian, your job is to listen and enjoy. You, of course, you'll probably have something to say at the end. Um, let's start with Lainey. Final thought on this? Sure. Um, I was just thinking about how one of the things I love so much about Emily Dickinson's work is that there's these brilliant shards that are kind of prismatic with the endless possibilities for reading. And I feel like what you've done here is to um, amplify that effect and multiply those meanings 
exponentially expanding the poetic field. Beautiful, thank you. Leanne Brown? Just two things, the word rude, also meaning earthly, and that it's almost like a sonnet. It's seven, it's seven and seven, it's 14 lines. Modern sonnet. You wrote a sonnet. <laughs> <laughs> Irene, final thought? Um, I, I was also thinking of the root idea, and also I like how, yeah, it's like a fine and sexy thing, but it's also like very loving and romantic. Like this, this ending is just so beautiful, so I like the, the balance in everything. Fantastic. Anthony? Uh, I'm thinking how rude Emily Dickinson can be R-E-D, <laughs> so it's a way that the poem can be read R-E-A-D, and also can be R-E-D, read, it can blush. And I just want to focus on the last line, which I've tried to understand. I mean, I think it goes in all kinds of ways, and I'm still working on it. Bliss, we're an oddity without thee. So with thee, bliss is not odd. That's sort of what you're saying generally about your relationship with Emily. She might be your thee there. Um, Ian, thank you for doing this work. And thank you for proving yet again, as many contemporary poets do, that in the simplest way of saying it, that readers of poetry need not encounter some sort of mytholo mythologized originality, that lines are out there to be used and to be made into new meanings, and they really are new meanings, and that that is a way that so much art in the other media, in the inter-art sense, which is one of your things, um, already has done that for 100 years. And it's been more recently, more recent for poets to take that up in the way the other arts have. And I think you're cl clearly a person who comes from all the arts to say, why can't we do that too as poets? So I think we should once more time <laughs> put our hands together for this wonderful poet. <laughs> <laughs>